Hey, thank you so much, Brian. And thanks to everyone who's joined us this morning uh, or this afternoon or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, we face some really unusual challenges today in trying to balance patient safety and the safety of our professional caregivers with person-centered values and principles. And we wanted to take the time today to talk about some of the major challenges that we are facing as we try to maintain our commitment to patient and person-centered care in the face of this unusual outbreak. And so we will go through a, a number of examples for you and some thoughts for consideration around those challenges and tie them to a couple of fundamentals of person and patient-centered care. Uh, the, the idea that we do things with patients and with families and not to them or for them, uh, the importance of not separating patients and residents from their family members, which is obviously an important social support network and how we might do that safely and responsibly. And also to talk a little bit about the how, because patient and person-centered care is not just what we do, it's how we do it. So how we language some of this, how we communicate uh, at this time is also very important. And so my colleagues here are going to help me out uh, to address those. We're going to look at some uh, specific examples in acute care. Rhonda is going to talk about communication strategies and Marita, who has quite a bit of expertise in long-term care settings, will share specific information on long-term care strategies. And then again, we hope to have some time at the end to hear uh, any concerns or questions or suggestions that you may have as well. I want to start by saying that uh, we are not infectious disease experts or experts on pandemics. And so the knowledge uh, that we are presenting is based on the lived experiences of patients and residents and their families and what they've communicated to us. Uh, and it's also based on current knowledge. And as we all would uh, confirm, we are in a situation that's very fluid. We're learning more literally every day about this virus and how it works. And so suggestions that we have today uh, may need to be updated tomorrow uh, or the next day. Uh, and of course, any recommendations or ideas that we share with you are not meant to override local regulations or mandates that in a care setting you may need to be abiding by. One of the things that we have consistently uh, said to patients, families, uh, the provider organizations that we work with is that especially now it's important that we stay focused on organizations that provide credible factual information. And so I, I, it would be remiss of me if I didn't point out the importance of staying current with what the World Health Organization guidelines are. That's certainly what we go to on a regular basis and also your local trusted sources, whether it's the Centers for Disease Control, which many uh, in the U.S. will focus on, or other regional authorities, and we've listed uh, one in the Netherlands. And I'm sure, depending on where you are tuning in uh, from around the world, there are local agencies that are your trusted sources as well. But amongst uh, uh, or amid that uh, important clinical information, that helps us to ensure that the care that we delivered uh, is high quality. We also have to remember the foundations of a person-centered healthcare system, which is something we all aspire to. And that is founded on partnership with patients and families. And we have to make sure that we don't lose that at this point in time. It also is care that's delivered with compassion, with kindness, with respect. And those are, again, qualities that we cannot lose. One of the concerns that we've had as an organization in our communications with our affiliates uh, has been some of the unintended consequences of restrictive policies that have been put into place in order to uh, react to the COVID-19 outbreak. And while in some circumstances, these may be responsible and they may make sense. I think we also have to acknowledge that there are many 
negative unintended consequences that are also important for our consideration. So for example, uh, my office is in a local community hospital in Connecticut in the Northeast uh, part of the US. We're about an hour and a half drive from New York City, which has been really the epicenter of the COVID-19 uh, outbreak in the United States. And what we've actually seen are very restrictive policies in some of the hospital centers in New York City uh, and women and their partners choosing to drive while they're in labor uh, hours away to come to a hospital that has not restricted the father's access to be present during childbirth. Uh, we've also seen parents who are reluctant to take their children to hospitals or into the emergency departments because they've heard that families are separated from their children. And whether that is uh, uh, correct or not, there is this growing and pervasive fear about that. Again, pointing out the importance of being clear in the way that we communicate uh, some of these new and hopefully temporary restrictions. We're hearing of individuals with cognitive impairments, individuals in behavioral health settings, uh, elders in gero psychiatric settings, becoming very traumatized and exhibiting stress behaviors when they are separated from their customary caregivers. We've heard so many heartbreaking stories of patients in hospitals dying uh, in ICUs with no loved one present uh, to comfort them. And of course, there's the impact on staff, uh, staff who are traumatized, who feel left to care for this incredible burden of the physical, psychological, spiritual, and emotional needs of patients when there is no family support, particularly at the end of life. And so these are important things for us to consider, uh, to make sure we include in our calculations as we're thinking about limitations and restrictions. And so I would ask that uh, providers and organizations and individuals who have some influence on local providers, think about what are the evidence-based or the factual uh, foundations for visitation restrictions that are being put into place and are they necessary? Uh, and are we really in a situation where we cannot uh, allow family uh, to be present? And so some of the things that we've seen organizations do in order to balance safety with the importance of family presence has been routine screenings for visitors uh, so that they can still enter, but they can enter safely. So they're screened for temperature, for symptoms. Uh, expectations are clearly set and education is provided around other safety uh, practices such as hand hy hygiene, cough etiquette, etc. Many organizations now are in situations where they have enough personal protective equipment. In the most cases, we're talking about masks, uh, possibly gloves, to provide those to family caregivers who want and need to be physically present with their loved ones. And so limiting visitation, uh, while it may be uh, indicated in some circumstances, may not be in many others, uh, particularly if these things are in place, that we have these safety practices in place, and the setting is in an area where there is not widespread active community transmission. Obviously in those cases, it would be the responsible thing to do to limit visitation to circumstances that are more uh, uh, serious. So for instance, in the case of a woman in childbirth or the case of a child coming to an emergency department or uh, uh, an individual at end of life. So we need to be mindful of the impact of any restrictions that we do put into place, whether it's in the acute care setting or long-term care, and Marika will talk about that a little bit later, but to think about the impact of that isolation, uh, that emotional and psychological trauma, which may continue to impact the individuals involved far beyond the uh, hospitalization, 
to make sure that we are being flexible in special cases, such as end of life, regardless really of the, you know, the indicators above, even in areas where there's active community transmission, uh, that we look for safe ways to allow family presence uh, during circumstances like end of life or childbirth. Also that we make sure that our communication strategies are very proactive, that we are fully explaining to patients and their families why we are doing these different things, how we are trying to protect their safety, the safety of their loved ones, and the safety of our professional caregivers. Uh, and I would say, uh, as an end note here, we, we don't know everything, right, that we need to know, or that we might want to know about this situation. And so this is a time for us to be creative and being uh, and open to different types of approaches and solutions, uh, even though we have to acknowledge they're not going to be perfect. Uh, some of the decisions that organizations have made have not been perfect. We're doing the best that we can with the information that we have uh, at any time. So I wanted to provide an example of uh, language, what I would say is person-centered or caring, compassionate language, uh, even amidst the need to limit visitation. And this is a sample visitation policy. I'll give you the URL that you can connect to it if you'd like to go online and uh, take a look at, the, at this. But this is a community hospital in an area where there is contained spread at this point. Uh, where there is enough protective equipment to be able to provide a mask to a loved one who wants to visit uh, a, a patient in the hospital. And there is testing available uh, as well. And so I wanted to point out a couple of important things about the way that we convey the, the information about visitation and family presence. So at this hospital, they're, they've highlighted that the precautions that are being taken, because there are limitations now on the number of family members who can be present at any one time, that these are temporary and they're there to protect visitors, caregivers in the community. So they're focusing on that importance of safety. That's why there will be some restrictions. Uh, they've been careful about the language uh, not to sound too uh, uh, harsh. So, for instance, instead of saying that visitors must enter through only this entrance, they've used softer language. Visitors may enter through our main entrance only. Uh, they clearly state what the special circumstances are when limitations on the numbers of visitors uh, will be lifted, and that includes at end of life in the case of a child or uh, during childbirth. Uh, they use language such as, please remain in your loved one's room. Uh, and I've seen policies that said, you must remain in your loved one's room. There are different ways of conveying the same message. Uh, you can certainly do that in a caring and compassionate manner. Uh, they've also provided alternatives. If family is not able to be physically present with their loved ones and given some examples such as Skype, FaceTime, or the telephone. Uh, they've clearly stated who may not receive visitors or, or excuse me, who may not come and visit uh, based on uh, their own physical condition so that people won't be surprised if they come uh, and are not able to uh, see their loved one. They've also referenced a local mandate. Uh, in this case, it's the governor of Connecticut so that people realize that we can't do perhaps uh, what we might individually choose to do that we also must be abiding by local mandates. And this is one of the reasons in this case, in this hospital, even though they've maintained visitation in most parts of the hospital, why they've had to limit it in the inpatient psychiatric unit. And then they end with a reassurance that they'll continuously assess these uh, policies and will update them so that uh, they'll maintain that commitment to person-centeredness as well as flexibility uh, in the way that they promote connection between families and patients. So I, I think that's a, a really good example for that uh, area, uh, for that situation and community. Uh, 
we continue to encourage hospitals, acute care settings to really challenge them, themselves in their own thinking about what they're basing their restrictions on. And we've seen a lot of language that uh, is restricting uh, the presence of any child or minor, uh, anyone 18 or younger to visit a loved one in a hospital. Uh, I understand early on there was concern because children who were in school settings were in large group settings with a lot of interactions and that might then increase the risk. Now that many schools uh, are uh, haven't been in session for a while and are not going to be going back into session for a while, I think the question comes up, is there a factual evidence base for using age as a restriction to visitation or should it be recency of a large group interaction? We've already talked about whether you're in a community where there's active spread versus containment what the availability of protective equipment is, the, the availability of testing. And so again, just that request that we base our limitations and, and restrictions around family presence on the guidance of credible institutions and not on fear. One of those credible institutions, as I mentioned before, of course, is the World Health Organization. And I wanted to share something that you can find on their website um, very important to that issue of women in, uh, who are in labor and uh, active uh, childbirth, uh, that even the WHO uh, has put out a notice that irrespective of whether you are in a community with active transmission or not, all women have the right uh, not only to respect and dignity, but to a companion of their choice. So we, we need to find ways uh, in cases like this where we can balance safety with person-centered care. I mentioned earlier that I provide some uh, links to family presence and visitation policies. Uh, the one that I was referencing at Griffin Hospital for uh, guidance for hospitals in areas with low community transmission can be found at this uh, URL, guidance for hospitals in areas that have very active community transmission where there are uh, more stringent restrictions in place. I've included URLs for the uh, guidance provided at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, which is still under active community transmission, uh, fairly widespread, and the guidelines of the New York State Health Department. And then last note, of course, we're hearing more and more about the longer term impact of patients in acute care settings who have spent time in the intensive care environment. And it really does pose some very special risks. I think particularly because of the, the number of patients uh, who have COVID-19 and do end up in ICUs. And we're seeing something called post ICU syndrome or PICS, uh, that it's something that not only are patients at risk for, but family members as well. And in part, this is due to the isolation of family and uh, patient, but also due to the fact that many patients with COVID-19 who are in the ICU, maybe in induced comas, uh, lose time and uh, you know, may go into that state thinking, well, I, I feel some light symptoms, and then days or weeks later wake up and wonder what has happened to me. And that causes quite a bit of trauma. And so we're looking at more and more approaches to try to help with post-ICU syndrome. Uh, one of the validated approaches is keeping a diary of the time spent by the patient in the ICU so that can be shared with them post-discharge. And I provided a, uh, a link to a digital diary that's been developed, uh, which may be of interest to people as well. All right, and with that, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Rhonda Williams, to talk a little bit about how to make sure that our communications remain patient and person-centered at this time. Thank you so much, Susan. Good day, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you might be in the world. And as Susan mentioned, no doubt we are in unprecedented times. We are in times um, of challenge, and we find ourselves um, interacting with in, uh, with our staff in ways that we would not ordinarily. We find ourselves caring for patients in ways that we would not expect to. 
And through all of this, how do we ensure that we are still making our caring visible? How do we ensure that the innate caring that we have shows through? One way for us to do that is through the words that we use. We know that words create the construct for our experience and that the words that we choose come with an emotional tone and it creates an environment. And then that environment may in turn lead to certain actions or behaviors. For instance, if we're using words um, such as battle or the front lines, what's the tone that we're creating? What's the emotional um, impact of these types of words? Um, when we are using labels such as um, hot one or Chinese virus, Again, are we putting ourselves in a position to um, introduce bias, even in an unintended way? And so the words that we choose are important for setting the tone, for creating the space and that allows our staff to operate as their best possible selves. Consider these phrases. There are times when even despite our very, very best intention, we use words or phrases um, and they may in fact have an impact uh, that we do not intend. I know for myself, when I hear the term hopefully, what do I take away from that? Do I feel exactly hopeful? Do I feel positive that this may in fact happen? Or do I feel like in effect, who really knows if that's going to happen? If I'm using phrases like the truth is, are you really saying that I probably shouldn't be telling you this? And the idea here is simply to consider the words or the phrases that you are using or that you are hearing in the organization. And then are they creating and are they creating an impact that you don't intend or are they in fact positioning you and the team to respond in a way that allows you to serve our patients and families the best? So I'd like you to consider how do you convey empathy? How do you do this in a very effective way? Well, I'd like to share with you a strategy that includes three essential elements. Those three elements are to recognize, and to communicate and then to support. And let's talk about what those means for just a second. To recognize means that you are in a position where you are understanding what you're hearing and seeing and around you. What are you hearing and seeing, not only verbally, but what are you feeling in terms of what's not being said, the verbal reaction that you're receiving? So that's recognition. As you then move into your communication phase, we wanna be sure that we are connecting, connecting from that human aspect that really shows our caring and allows that to come through. So we wanna communicate with empathy and doing so in a way that we are connecting with those that we serve. And then it goes beyond communication and recognition. We want to be able to support. So what can we do? What's the opportunity to take action, to serve, so that we can um, provide that partnership, which is what we're here for. Here's a scenario. And in this scenario, we wanted to show you what this looks like in action, what it sounds like. Obviously, we want you to use the words that are comfortable for you, the words that um, are culturally acceptable in your organization. In this scenario, this is a visitor who is screen positive and has a slight fever upon coming to the hospital. So when we use our RCS um, framework, initially we wanna recognize what might the visitor be feeling? Mind you, they may have just traveled uh, quite a distance to visit their loved one, maybe not even being aware that they had a temperature. And so they might be a little bit frustrated or angry. And you on the other side of this are being protective and cautious, but also empathetic about the situation that they're facing. So how might you communicate this? You might say something like this. It sounds like you're very frustrated with not being able to see your mom right now. I want to assure you that your loved ones, as well as all other patients, are a top priority as we work with you through this situation. We do have some options that we'd like to share with you if that's okay. And the idea here is to, again, recognize what they're seeing and what you're feeling. 
communicate in a way that connects and shows our compassion, and then supporting and providing options. There's a few other considerations. In situations like we are facing, some of our standard practices, uh, we are evaluating everything. Nothing feels normal in this day and time. And so as we think about some standard practices such as team rounding and bedside shift change, and also volunteers that serve our organizations, we might be thinking, how do we best protect the safety of our patients and families and our staff. So the tendency might be to do some blanket suspensions of these types of practices. What we're asking you to consider instead is to be very thorough and thoughtful and use evidence-based approaches to how you do this. Now, you and your teams, I'm sure, have been very creative through these times, and we're asking you to continue to extend that creativity to some of our standard practices so that we can safely provide care while still ensuring partnership of our patients and families. In terms of your patient family partner counsel, it's another one of those practices that you might consider, do we suspend the practices? At this point, we don't see any evidence base, uh, any evidence basis for that type of a decision, but certainly you may want to engage in some different types of practices, such as maybe virtual meetings or settings and you know, engaging that feedback in a very different way so that we continue to have their voices during this time that is very, very important, but we don't um, disconnect from the activities and the basis of who we are, which is the partnership of our service to our patients and families. Thank you, Rhonda. And we're going to move now to Marita, and Marita is going to focus on the long-term care and group care setting. Yes. Thank you, Susan and Rhonda. And, and nice to meet you all here. I've seen you from all over the world. Um, and like I was introduced, I will tell a bit about long-term care. And um, uh, we found this, uh, this picture, and uh, this was a quote from a broadcast in California, as an example of actions family were taking. Um, uh, and some of the media responded like, uh, this was perfectly appropriate. I think it's worth discussing the pros and cons of this response since uh, it's something that has been happening in response to the very restricted family access. We had quite similar questions from families in, in the Netherlands and in the end um, there were barely residents taken out of the nursing homes. And I think the, uh, the, the best way was just to have the dialogue with the, um, the family members about the impact of the care we have to uh, deliver to those very frail persons. Um, and um, as uh, Susan already mentioned some of the other unattended consequences of the restrictions, um, we see um, that in um, uh, not only uh, individuals with cognitive impairments uh, becoming traumatized and uh, exhibiting stress behaviors, but we also see it uh, with family uh, families of the residents. Uh, because they are not allowed to go into um, the nursing homes. And as said before, uh, also here we see the traumatized staff left to take care of the physical, psychological, spiritual and emotional needs of the residents in, in the long-term care facilities. So all things we have to consider. Um, in line with uh, the guidance for the hospitals, there, there is some guidance of the double, double, uh, WHO for long-term care facilities. And um, the co main conclusion is in areas where the COVID-19 transmission has been documented, access to visitors in long-term care facilities should be restricted. So they are pointing out to the areas where uh, transmission has been documented. Um, uh, but also they, uh, do a, uh, they give a call, uh, alternatives to in-person visiting should be explored, including the use of telephones, videos, or other uh, protective materials like uh, plastics or glass between residents and visitors. Um, 
And um, th there are reasons to think uh, about when visitors uh, are really needed. Um, and the, the main reason are on compassionate grounds. For instance, when residents are gravely ill uh, in end of life situations. And I think um, the guidelines of the WHO is what we see in, in the Netherlands that um, uh, in respite to other countries, but in, in uh, many countries, uh, we are happy that people don't die alone. Um, I uh, brought you um, this special document. As many of you will know that the Netherlands is slowly uh, reversed the lockdown. And as a pilot, which currently started this week, um, uh, a pilot among 26 nursing homes, that's about 1% of the nursing homes we have in the Netherlands. Um, uh, one of the Plaintree members, Riva Sorg Group, a gold certified Plaintree member, together with a group of experts, developed a guideline to help um, the complete nursing home um, uh, organizations in the Netherlands to open up again. Uh, and in addition to safety, human and ethical aspects play an important role in these guidelines. Unfortunately, this document is only available in Dutch, but uh, hopefully um, if you can download it, you can translate it with Google uh, Translate. What I like about this document is that where possible, it's thought uh, to let residents decide themselves. Of course, when they are no longer able to do this, uh, relatives will play a role in this. The aim is to find good, uh, safe and workable ways for all. And for all is for the residents, for the families and for the caregivers uh, per location. So there are uh, in this document national guidelines, but it's not a detailed protocol for all nursing homes. And uh, that's the thing I like. So each nursing home in partnership in, in their situation can develop its own protocol. Um, I like to share some of the examples because visitation was restricted very much. Now we have 26 of the nursing homes in a pilot. So 99% uh, of the nursing homes still uh, have restricted visitation policies. And um, what can we do? And so the window visits are currently very popular in the Netherlands, uh, especially now that the weather is getting better and um, where the building does not have suitable facilities to facilitate those uh, window visits. Uh, we see that even with very, e very simple materials like a party tent, um, window visiting is made possible. We see also that fans uh, are used for that. So inside the fan, the fan is split in two. Uh, in the front is the part where the family can uh, enter. And in the back is the, the part where the uh, residents can enter. And that is, that's a way how they can meet each other. Another example uh, to meet is uh, the use of aerial work uh, platforms. Um, and there are a lot of companies at the moment that um, uh, offer them uh, to, um, to nursing homes and make schedules that relatives can, can visit the, the um, uh, residents of the nursing homes. And this uh, is especially helpful when residents have to stay in bed and uh, cannot uh, move between uh, the uh, different levels of, uh, of a building. Uh, video calling also was mentioned in, in the WHO guideline. Uh, we see video calling is widely used, uh, but video calling has a lot of challenges, uh, mainly for people with hearing, hearing difficulties. And uh, in this group, we see a lot of uh, people. Um, I think we should be aware that there are events that require special attention, such as funerals. Um, and video calling is a way to have uh, people, residents, uh, be uh, a bit part of um, these special and sad events. 
Um, in any case, the numbers of moments of interactions is limited, uh, which is why I like this example very uh, appealing. In this example, we see how family members were able to assemble a placemat printed by a special company that allows residents to see their relatives at all meals, every, uh, several moments a day. And uh, I'm quite sure that um, you all have also the Facebook calls to send cards uh, to residents who are lonely, who, are, uh, who don't have um, uh, families to, to connect with them. Um, uh, and we see that uh, nursing homes uh, do get a lot of attention, do uh, get a lot of uh, response on, on the calls on Facebook. Uh, on the right side, you see a postcard um, uh, which has been developed uh, by the organization, by the nursing home. They held a photo shoot with their residents and with Easter, they sent postcards outside the nursing home. So I also liked this example. It's uh, the post coming in and it's post coming, uh, going out of uh, the nursing home. Um, and it's very important to think about the family members who are forced to stay at home. Sometimes they suffer even more than the people inside the nursing homes. Um, we hear a lot from our caregivers that it's uh, on departments with patients with uh, dementia, with Alzheimer, it's actually quite, uh, really quiet at the moment because there are not uh, so much uh, people coming in and out the, the, the wards. And um, uh, actually that, that has a bit of positive side also for, for these frail people. Um, and, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's hard for, uh, for the family at home. Uh, on the right, you see phone teams that has, have been set up in some organizations to call family members just for a talk. How are you today? How do you feel? Um, and just some human action, interaction for, uh, for, uh, for a small period of time. And uh, in the end, uh, uh, we have uh, not to forget our staff. The burden on caregivers is great. All over the world, the heroes, uh, heroes in healthcare are honored in different ways. Um, and they deserve it so much. Uh, we also see that companies send many products as presents to show them their things. We see cakes, flowers, chocolates, beauty products, protection materials, and much more. And uh, this whole turn of things, um, it, in this whole turn of thing, it might just happen that you as an employer forget to be aware of your own personal notes to your um, uh, to, to your caregivers. So um, be aware, be there for your people. Uh, they need you really, uh, re really at this moment, uh, but also ask them what they need from you. Um, and uh, also when we go back to normal, I think that uh, we, we became in a situation in a, in a very abrupt way and uh, people will also be afraid to go back to normal. And that's what we see in the Netherlands, where we are uh, taking the step, steps at this moment. Uh, and it's not only the employees uh, in the most needed professions at the moment that need our attentions. There are also people who are without work at home in our facilities. And they can feel enormously guilty and lost, and they also need our attention. Uh, what can we do? A lot of examples you've seen on the slides. Um, huddles, uh, pastoral uh, care. Um, I think uh, um, oh, the, the first one is, I think, is very important, the knowledge of stress and, and grief. And I think we will take, uh, we will need some time for, for that, even after uh, the first period of this, this uh enormous, uh, challenging time. Um, I like this example uh, because um, uh, we are um, 
wearing uh, uh, the mask. And there are many, many false expectations about the protection of masks when we are not using them in a wide way. Uh, this was an, a poster developed by our Ministry of Health. And I think it's very helpful uh, to help uh, caregivers, but also uh, families and, and uh, uh, to use these materials in, in the best way. Uh, we collected some evidence about uh, taking care of uh, caregivers. You can find the, uh, the information of these resources uh, with, with the internet links. All right, thank you, Marita. Appreciate all of the wonderful examples that you've provided from long-term care environments. Uh, I, I wanted to conclude our remarks by uh, issuing a little bit of a call to action to everyone who is uh, on the call with us today, because I think many of us are thinking, well, what's next? What are the next steps? How do we address these challenges around uh, remaining person-centered and patient-centered at this time, and particularly the impact on families and patients and residents? Uh, I would ask that you join ISQA and Plain Tree in something that we're calling the Pop-Up Coalition to Preserve Family Presence in Healthcare Settings. Uh, that coalition is a, a very diverse group coming together for a short time to uh, take what we've learned from the COVID-19 situation so far and its impact on family presence and to develop a set of comprehensive guidelines that balance safety with compassion and partnership uh, and also that support person-centered care principles. Uh, our hope is that uh, once we have finalized those guidelines, uh, they'll be available through ISQA uh, and its uh, online resources. And we would ask all of you to help us to promote these guidelines throughout all of your network of contacts as well. So with that, uh, I think I will turn things back to Brian uh, so that we can take any questions, any concerns, or if anyone has ideas uh, that you'd like to share in terms of solutions to some of these challenges. Excellent. Thank you so much, Susan and uh, Rhonda and Marita for a fantastic presentation. Um, just there's overwhelmingly positive comments throughout. Uh, everyone really, really enjoyed it. Um, so we're, we're going to transition to our Q&A section now. So while I'll, I'll ask people to start thinking about their questions and maybe popping them in the Q&A box, but you can also, if you see questions in there that you would like to see prioritized, you can upvote them as well. So please have a look at the questions there. And just while, while you're working on your questions, uh, I will just let you know that, um, yeah, if you found today's presentation helpful, uh, then please see our, our, our COVID resources page as well. Um, we've collated resources from all around the world related to different backgrounds and contexts. And there's useful resources for, for everyone there in any sort of background and context. So please feel free to check it out. And also tomorrow we have another live webinar uh, with Sue Hignett and, and Paul Bowie on human factors in the design and operation of ventilators for COVID-19. That's at midday uh, Dublin or London time tomorrow. And one of the small positives that's come out of this whole situation is the strength of the, the community, the ISCO community and the Plane Tree community and everyone coming together to, uh, to continue to support one another and help us through this very difficult time. So um, if not already, then I'd please uh, consider becoming an ISCO member, maybe just to, to help us and support us in continuing to do what we do at the moment. So yes, I can see the questions flooding in now. So again, thank you so much, guys. So I'm going to jump straight into it now. Um, Rhonda, this first one is from you, from, from Peter, um, who said, Rhonda, this is so powerful. I believe this is relating to, to your, the, the table with the, the different meanings and context behind words. Um, do you have a compendium of words that we need to change and how can we have caregivers understand the power of language and words? Hi, Peter. Uh, thank you so much for this question. Uh, in fact, we, our team had a, a pretty um, robust discussion around words and what are some other words that we could uh, use. 
If you visit uh, Plaintree.org and visit the COVID resources, there is actually a document there that lists out some of the ideas that we came up with. Now, know that this is just a starting point. Uh, we identified some of the common words um, that we hear very frequently and potentials uh, that you might use instead. I would also encourage you to um, have fun with this. This is, I think, a real opportunity to engage your team, your leaders, your staff by saying to them, you know, we want to look at words. We know the power of words. What are some words you're hearing that don't make you feel good, that make you feel like, you know, maybe we should be conveying a different message? And I think you'll be surprised at how creative they are and how in tune they are with some of the words. And in fact, they will offer suggestions and then the team can talk about those and come up with um, which ones you wanna adopt as an organization. So firstly, on the Plain Tree uh, website, there is a document there uh, that talks about some of the words that we've identified and you might find that helpful. And then secondly, it's a really great opportunity to engage your team and a full dialogue about the power and the impact of words. I think you'll be um, surprised and delighted at what you receive from that. Excellent. Thanks so much, Rhonda. Mm -hmm. Our next question is from Anthony Staines in Switzerland. Um, in a time of pandemic crisis, it will be great for a hospital to be able to get advice from patient partners about the needs of patients and the messages to spread, etc. Is this realistic? And if so, what will be the practical steps to take to do so? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think a really important one uh, because this is not the time to lose that connection with patients uh, and uh, their families in our community about what is most important to them. And so I think there are a lot of different strategies that can be used. Uh, one of those I think uh, Rhonda alluded to, if you have a patient family partnership council, certainly meeting, virtual meetings can still be organized and you can have that ongoing input from them. Uh, we also do a lot of focus group work with family, with discharged patients, community members. We've moved a lot of that focus group work to online virtual focus groups or telephone-based focus groups. So that's another strategy. You could look at patients, for instance, who have been discharged recently, who've been through this experience in your healthcare institution, and to reach out to them and ask them, you know, what would have made their experience a more positive experience? What advice might they have for you? Marita, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, thank you, Susan. I, I would like, I mentioned the, the phone panel, uh, which uh, just phoned to all the families at home. And that was also a way to uh, receive a lot of information about uh, and ideas from them, what the organization could do. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, focus groups, I think is, is a, a perfect way, but just uh, call them uh, um, and uh, ask them what uh, what do they what would they think what would be helpful, and uh, that was what we found in uh, in the Netherlands with the with the nursing homes. Excellent, thanks to you both. And just in response to that as well, we had Charmaine Jones in Canada say that the the patient advisory network would like to be involved and are ready to be helpful as well. Uh, so our next question from Laurie, uh, I've heard some clinicians don't like being referred to as heroes. How do you manage that when so much language is focused on the metaphor? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting observation and I'll, I, I'll just initially respond and then maybe others have thoughts about that. You know, I, I think this goes back to uh, the slide that we had with words that we're beginning to hear that are, are filtering in as we all live this experience, and that there is a lot of military-type references that are being used uh, as we uh, experience the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, front lines, and we're waging a war, and, you know, if you are a part of the provider team, you're a hero. Uh, so I, I do understand why uh, some uh, folks would be uncomfortable with that terminology. And I would encourage all of us as a community of caring to be sensitive to that and to perhaps find some alternatives that are more comfortable uh, for people. Yeah. Your thoughts? 
I, I could also imagine that uh, when when you are mentioned, when you are called the hero, um, it it might be hard to uh, talk about your own fears, your own worries, your own uh, whatever. Uh, so I, I can imagine that it's not always uh, nice to be a hero. Um, uh, and uh, I know the intent of people is to be thankful to them, but it's uh, it, it might might get confusing. Absolutely. And, I, and I'd just like to add to that, it really goes back to the discussion where we talked about intent versus impact. And so the intention is kind, it's genuine, it's compassionate, but the impact and how it lands on some of our caregivers is often not received that way. So I think returning to your original purpose, what is the purpose of using the term hero? I think it's to convey gratitude and you know care uh, for the work that's being done. And there are many, many ways to convey that um, without adding that label that some might be uncomfortable with. Excellent, thank you everyone. Our next question from Sarah. How do we maintain the enthusiasm of the medical system after the pand pandemic has um, ended? Wow, I, I guess we all wish we had the answer to that, Sarah. <laughs> uh, again, I, I think that this is something that we, we have to be very sensitive to on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, that we not fall into the trap of being so focused on this intense response, uh, thinking this is going to end at some point, and then we'll take care of our staff, or then we'll reconnect to our values as an organization. I think it's important to be having those conversations now uh, as we're going through this, uh, not to, uh, to fall into that mindset of, we're just gonna focus on this one thing, we're gonna keep as much control as we can, and then later we'll deal with it. Because that, I believe, will make it more difficult as we move out of the intense phase of this pandemic uh, to be able to reconnect to our purpose and our mission. We've got to find ways to do that now. And I, I think there were some nice examples that have been provided, uh, but I'll give uh, Marita and Rhonda an opportunity to comment as well. Um, I, I think we also learn very much from this uh, episode of in our lives because um, uh, before uh, the the pandemic, uh, we we had a lot of um, uh, working groups and uh, and uh, sometimes we had a lot of uh, very tough ways to get uh, change organized in our organizations. And during this time, we see that a lot of issues have been solved in such a easy and quick way that that's also uh, that we also can learn from that, and that will also uh, stimulate enthusiasm uh, in our organizations. It doesn't have to be that difficult uh, as we. Uh, uh, experienced it before. So let's keep uh, the, the good things uh, from this, this uh, period and um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, keep them safe. Excellent. Thank you, Marita and Susan. Uh, our next question from Linda. How do we enable our health staff to consider shared decision making in times of crisis when time is short? And that, that I think is such uh, an important issue. And it goes back to my opening statement in which I said the founding principle of a person-centered care system is that we do things with patients and families and not to them or for them. And I think one of our biggest challenges right now has been the erosion of doing things with our patients, asking them for their input uh, and then aligning the way that we provide care and what we what care we provide uh, along with their values and their preferences. I think that it's a false economy to think that we can't or we don't have time to engage in shared decision making today. I think there's probably never been a more important time to be actively involved in shared decision making conversations with patients and families. Uh, if not now, when? So this is really putting us to the test. And I just I encourage everyone 
to recommit to those foundations of person-centered care. Uh, we have to find creative solutions. We have to find ways. We have to find the time to have those conversations. Now, I realize if you were in the middle of the epicenter, uh, you know, for instance, if you were an emergency department in New York City a month ago, that may be unrealistic. But most of us are not in that situation. You know, most of us are in communities, uh, in provider settings where there's not widespread uncontrolled spread where we can take the time to have a shared decision-making conversation. Uh, I would also say the guidelines that Marita mentioned that are coming from a long-term care uh, group out of the Netherlands really deal with those issues of what, what, what are the patient's rights uh, to self-determination. And I would encourage you to access those. It's a wonderful, really, it's a wonderful ethical document to read. And we did actually already Google Translate it, and we added it to the pandemic resources on the Plain Tree website. So you can go uh, to the website and on the landing page, the banner that says, you know, pandemic uh, resources, and you can find that paper. And I, I would really highly recommend that people uh, familiarize themselves with that. And Susan, I'd like to add um, to that because I think this part is really important that this is an opportunity to bring things down and make it uh, very practical and bring it down to its simplest form. Leverage your internal processes that you already have. It doesn't require a separate meeting to get the staff together and ask them what they think. If you are engaged in leadership rounding or patient rounding, or if you're doing huddles, those are prime opportunities to get input and feedback um, in some formal and informal ways. You can identify little processes. You can have a notebook that people can uh, jot down their thoughts. You can leave it on a unit so that maybe I might not have time right now, but if I have five minutes later, I can visit that and jot it down when it comes to mind. So I think keeping it simple and leveraging your internal structures and processes that you already have is really important right now. Excellent, thank you guys. I, I'm conscious of the time now, we've just gone past the hour. Uh, we do have one question here, which I think is quite important. So I might ask just very quickly if we could at the end. Um, John has asked, this virus drives a wedge between patients and providers, stretching compassion and increasing stress. Verbal communication is important in ameliorating this but do you have any tips tips for optimizing body language while wearing PPE? Yeah, that that's a that's a good one. It, we've actually seen some wonderful examples of of creativity around that, where uh, people have personalized the face masks that they're wearing, so uh, they maybe have a smile on them. Others have created face masks where there's actually a plastic window, so that your your facial expressions are uh, visible. And so uh, you can just Google those online uh, and make them yourselves or find places to uh, purchase those. But I, I, would, I would suggest that because you're right, so much is lost if you're not able to see someone's expression. Absolutely. And then there are um, things like tone and your posture, maintaining an open and welcoming posture and a gentle touch and um, you know, there are other things that we can do as well while we are not able to see the full face in many times, um, but tone goes a long way and you can often hear your kindness, caring and compassion. I also want to add um, a really important aspect of this is active listening. And so conveying that you are paying attention, that you are being present and that you are mindful in this interaction also is another way to convey your caring.